Hey, welcome to my show. I'm Schnoodlebug. This is a DIY podcast about making stuff no matter what. As always, this episode is brought to you by Schnoodle Video, your one-stop media shop. Khalil Haddad is an experimental filmmaker and video artist based in Toronto, whose film The Taking of Jordan was awarded Best of the Festival at Chicago's Onion City Fest in 2022. He also worked as an assistant editor for Kazakh Radwanski's film Anne at 13,000 Feet. Khalil graciously took the time to talk shop with me late last year. I had some cousins come down and visit me probably uh, when I was nine years old, and they had just like a little kid's version of like a camcorder, basically. And I just had so much fun kind of just like running around with that, filming them, that uh, eventually I got my parents to buy me like a legit camcorder. And then from there, I started making uh, full on kind of uh, short films, a lot of like kind of sketch comedy, basically, like very like mad TV inspired. Um, And that was kind of my first foray into filmmaking was through these comedy skits that I would like make with my uh, cousins, basically, just with like family. Um, And then that developed into, yeah, over time, as I like became a teenager, making more um, serious work, like getting into more, uh, yeah, playing around more with like kind of experimental techniques and uh, kind of moving beyond what I had initially been doing um, when I first started uh, as a kid. And that's kind of just continued to snowball into what I'm doing now, going deeper into kind of experimental work and really kind of pursuing that. What what were your first uh, kind of influences that took you to that more experimental level in your teen years? Hmm. I mean, I I wouldn't call them experimental filmmakers exactly, but I was really inspired uh, as an early teen a lot by like Larry Clark. And I think I just really loved the boldness of his vision. And the fact that he was willing to cover these things and willing to go to places that I wasn't, I hadn't seen other, especially at that age, hadn't seen other filmmakers go to. And so I think that kind of directness um, in his style was a big inspiration. But um, I was really into his earlier works. Yeah, Kids, Ken Park, Bully. I Bully's my favorite of his films. Yeah, just I guess the uh, kind of transgressive vibe that he brought to all of these stories that really could just be like lifetime movies lifetime teen dramas you know i mean after school specials and he brought this kind of a darkness to these narratives Mm -hmm. Uh, i just i I found so um i guess attractive at like a formative age there's a lot of things that i'm I'm recognizing between the films one of the styles that i i see is that kind of or here rather is that chopped and screwed almost vaporwave kind of sound first of all are you doing that yourself I, uh, I did do all of those myself. I see when I'm working with found footage a lot like uh, like a DJ, really. Like just but working with uh, visual material as well as musical kind of material as well and seeing how I can kind of mash those up. Do, I, like, I love, um, I, mean, I mean, you mentioned uh, the Glue Trilogy. There's a lot of like musical switch ups in that. Mm-hmm. And uh, the way that it looks like cut into very abruptly into other scenes. Um, so yeah, really seeing it more uh, in, a, in a musical way, I suppose, especially in the style that I edit and really wanting to kind of, uh, I think of it as like wanting to create the kind of emotional impact that like a song so directly can. I feel like music is so just, um, it, it gets us in a way emotionally that I think that not that film necessarily doesn't always when it's just static. Yes. Um, and so really playing around with the form of that and kind of bringing, yeah, a, a a musicality or a musical quality uh, to to the films themselves, just in the way that the form is constructed. The the glue trilogy in particular feels like an audiovisual mixtape in that sense, right? And you have all these connecting characters and and scenes. That actually touches on another question: that kind of shared universe aspect. Is that something that you're interested in utilizing further? Yeah, maybe not so much a shared universe as it is. Uh, like I see the glue trilogy as as one real, like complete work, but in three parts. Mm-hmm. And so in that way, those works uh, overlap. And uh, even though they all t- each film tells its own kind of thematic narrative, if you will, by watching them in succession, you get this kind of larger you get a larger scope of who these characters are, what the themes of it are and just kind of like a yeah exploring more of like a worldview through these three films or a worldview of the characters rather uh in terms of an interconnected universe i mean not narratively in any sense but i love working with uh the same actors and having them cross over between my different films and even though they're playing different characters and they're in different situations there's something about i suppose the intertextuality of that the fact that um 
the char- like the character in um, uh, Boys of Summer is also the star of His Smell. And yes. I think that like having that same actor in these two different roles, even though they're not the same character, we can almost imagine that, this, that the backstory of His Smell is the character of Boys of Summer in a funny way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's interesting. And I think it colors the work in a, in a very different kind of way. But in terms of any kind of direct narrative connections, I would say not so much. Yeah, uh, on your website, you call yourself a filmmaker and a video artist. And I, I guess I'm mm-hmm. curious as to what the distinction is between the two in your mind. I mean, I, I think of a filmmaker, of course, like a director in the traditional sense, right? They're working with a crew, they're telling narrative films. Um, they have, they're, they're maybe working with more of a production, even if that production, I think, is like four or five people. You know what I mean? Um, like, I really like working with, with the exception of Farm Boy, which is my biggest crude film. Um, with the exception of that one, all of my other films have probably max like four crew members on them. But uh, the distinction for me as a filmmaker kind of, or as a director working with other collaborators and then as a video artist, really working in things by myself. Like you mentioned The Taking of Jordan, that's a film that I made with no crew, that's just me. And so uh, my distinction as a video, as a, in terms of video artist or that term would be the fact that I'm, I'm looking at it as more, um, I, I said DJ earlier, but I would also say like more of like a painterly quality, like really working on it in and of myself, like as an artist, mm-hmm. I'm doing the sound design, I'm, I'm editing it, I'm compi- like I'm finding the found footage and compiling that. So it goes beyond directing in, in a traditional sense, how you would direct a film or a narrative and becomes more of a creating more of an art piece, I would say, or like a vi- yeah, or a video art piece. And so for me, yeah, that's kind of the distinction in these two different modes that I operate in as a director with crew and then in and of myself, remixing, manipulating, doing like found footage kind of pieces. Because I would say even uh, the Glue trilogy, yes, there is a crew behind that, but that came out of a shoot that I did in um, 2017 that I had, um, I had abandoned basically. It was a, it was a very large anthology narrative film. I sat on this footage for a while and then I reapproached it on my own and just kind of, and made it into these three experimental pieces, uh, just through editing, manipulating what was into this new thing. So for me, that's more of the, my, how I see my role as a video artist versus a traditional kind of director. I, I watch you kind of sharpening your editing blade before the taking of Jordan. And and then with the taking of Jordan, you're utilizing such a limited amount of ingredients, be it grain, archival footage or pics or, or strobe, and your cutting is extremely selective. That short just has these moments that cut like a knife. Is that more of, I guess, a conscious direction into more horror-based editing? With this film, I really went in wanting to intentionally make something different. So build upon what I had done in terms of my editing style, but kind of take that in a new direction. And I mean, horror is my favorite genre. Um, I think you can see horror in some of my other films, but maybe a bit more subtly. Like I would say that uh, Farm Boy contains a lot of like horror elements yes. in it without being a actual horror film. Yeah, like, I mean, I've always been interested in working in these kinds of modes. Yeah, like, I would say, like, Lucio Fulci is, like, one of my favorite directors, and I've taken, um, and I find a lot of, like, inspiration in his work, and uh, especially, like, that 70s, 80s wave of, like, Italian horror. King of Jordan is actually the first part of a trilogy, or I should say it's it's the second film in a trilogy. I just completed uh, the first part of it, and now I'm working on the third part of it. Okay. And all together, kind of like Glue, they're all their own individual films. They tell their own individual narratives, but thematically, they kind of uh, have a lot of overlap together. So I would say the one I just finished is almost like a yeah a thematic prologue to The Taking of Jordan. But also, I would say also a little less horror. It's, it's, it is operating in a kind of horror uh, sphere, but... It's doing so in a way that's very different from the horror of Taking of Jordan. What was your first experience with Strobe, by the way? Like as a viewer or as a filmmaker? I guess as a viewer. When was the first time that clicked for you as a a device that you wanted to utilize? I mean, it's hard for me to pinpoint, I guess, the first time that I, that Strobe really kind of registered to me. I think um, in the last few years, I've been really fascinated by the work of uh, Takashi Ito Mm. and... uh, he doesn't always necessarily use strobe as strobe, but the way that he uses flicker and the fact that he's doing these films that are like stop motion photography and have this kind of more abrasive, kind of janky kind of quality to it, while also at the same time, yeah, playing with strobe, these two kind of modes of like unsettling the audience. And I think a lot of experimental film techniques are very unsettling. I can't get enough of strobe as an ingredient, as its own thing. 
Uh, so I always yeah. like to ask filmmakers that utilize it just, you know, what their first experience with it was uh, or their first kind of conscious love for strobe and like where that comes from. Because obviously it's, obviously it's very, maybe not controversial, but, you know, it's scary to some people as a technique, as a thing. It's just it can cause health problems, all that kind of stuff, right? You know? <laughs> it, it does have this effect um, on the audience. And I not even with the strobe technique specifically, but with my films, I really want to like jolt the audience into kind of being aware of what they're watching. Um, I don't want it to be a passive experience and I feel like I like using stroke to kind of, or even like we were talking about before, like these musical switch ups, like, okay, like, like wake the fuck up. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Like if you're not, if you're not already awake for this movie, now you are, you know what I mean? Absolutely. um, What you're talking about before, just like uh, maybe more traditional kind of short filmmaking. And I, I feel like so many times, like when you see a short film in a program, it can kind of sink into the background it can kind of just like play it can play one note almost and and that can be fine you know what i mean some people are just making more traditional narrative drama stuff you know what i mean and it doesn't have to be chaotic right but that's not really the mode that i want to work in and so i really want my pieces to stand on their own in and of themselves and not just be one of a showcase or one of a festival and i really want them to kind of yeah operate as their own if you saw this as its own work disconnected from these other films would you connect with it, right? Mm. And I think these techniques that kind of engage the audience, right? And I shouldn't say, yeah, not just jolt them, but like really like engage them and like wake them up to what they're watching and to not watch a short in a in a passive way, right? As so often I find that can happen when when a film is just seen within the context of a larger kind of program. Yes. Right? Also at the same time too, uh, you're, you're utilizing strobe in uh, quite unique ways from what I've seen before, like especially in Boys of Summer, how you utilize it over top of the still images that almost, it almost has a morphine effect. I couldn't even really tell because of the strobing. Maybe you can answer that question. Like, what, was there some like manipulation of the images in between or was that literally just like a cross dissolve with the strobe over top of that? That was creating that effect. Yeah, I believe, yeah, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's just a, that's a still image with the strobe over top of it. But I also love I, I, yeah, and I you've seen my other works too. Well, again, especially with taking a Jordan, like I love the idea of like working with still imagery. And again, treating film as not just like what is being like lot like recorded in front of the camera, uh, <clears throat> twenty four frames per second, right? But what is the power of an individual still frame, and like what is the meaning behind that? Uh, I've, I don't know if you saw this one. I've uh, I, had an, I have another film that I'm just in the process of releasing right now. It just premiered in uh, Winnipeg at Windex. Uh, Paul and Eileen had four children. That's an entire uh, film of just of strictly just still images, no right. video, just still images and sound design. And yeah, working in these kind of ways that I guess I don't see a lot of, I, I would call it a documentary and I don't really see documentaries work in that kind of formal, in those, in those ways formally. So yeah, just really, really fascinating. Like what can we learn from just like a single frame? What is the information that that can convey and what is the power in that? Having a voiceless narrator and utilizing the text that way is also very powerful. I guess I see more as what I'm doing as opposed to like uh, being influenced by an essay film or being influenced by a Flickr film or like really uh, taking in a lot of these different kind of aesthetics or as different formal kind of styles and mashing, again, DJ, like mashing mm-hmm. them into kind of one piece. So it's less about being inspired by a specific mode in terms of it is like individual pieces, I think, and just the different ways that they're operating i would say i'm less influenced by uh specific filmmakers and more so by specific films i love um, it okay yeah like i do have my favorite filmmakers but i don't think that they're necessarily like direct influences mm-hmm. um i think in part they are and i think i have inspiration from them but i don't think that i'm trying to like ape uh like a takashi ito film or I mentioned Fulci earlier, Larry Clark. Like, I'm not trying to make their film. Uh, I think there's different kind of a- a- attributes of their individual works that I like. Like exactly, like I, I don't think I'm pulling any inspiration from Ken Park. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. but a filmmaker like him, I think in his vision and like in his like I mentioned boldness, I think it was more of an inspiration than kind of formal elements. So it's really just seeing the way that like other filmmakers, I think, work with uh, the medium and what they're able to express with it, and kind of gaining inspiration from that. Uh, as opposed to a, a direct kind of rip of for uh, style or anything like that. Uh, on that note, do you remember when form became something that you noted uh, as something that, you know, you're, you're collecting these techniques and, and building your arsenal of techniques? Do you remember when form within film became something that you were kind of tuned into? 
I think when I was making Farm Boy, it became a big, um, a big focal point of the process of that. That film took probably six months to edit because it really was a lot of like stru- in terms of uh, structuring the film. Like from what we had shot, I decided to kind of restructure it differently in editing and um, really pay more attention to the like the form in that sense in terms of the pacing of the movie and um, and really allowing some of these shots to play out in a in a much more extended manner. Mm -hmm. Um, so really utilizing, yeah, more of these cinematic, uh, forms to tell this narrative as opposed to, um, my three earlier films were, I had made two documentaries and and an experimental piece, but the experimental still had like traces of narrative in it. Right. And so I would say those, those three films all thematically narratively tell, uh, stories that I'm still kind of, uh, and operating themes that I'm still playing around with. But I think Farm Boy is like the demarcation mark where, I'm taking these kind of ideas and now I'm paying even more attention to uh, the form. And, and yeah, and, and in terms of like how, uh, how to structure, how to structure that for like the most effective kind of narrative punch, really. And um, Farmway was the first, uh, well, no, I shouldn't say that because I edited my previous film with a co-editor and then I edited Farmboy and um, my follow-up, Tiger Eats a Babe with a co-editor. Those three were kind of joint edits in a sense. Mm-hmm. And then from there, kind of bouncing off and really becoming my own editor and I think it really took playing around with uh, and exploring for more to kind of gain that and kind of go full on with uh, these future projects. Well, there's nothing I've ever wanted to do besides make films. And so uh, like from the moment I picked up a camera. And so for me, there was no other option than to pursue it to the fullest. It, it really came down to when I was 15, I made this one film. And it was so unlike anything I had made up until that point, which again, were more like sketch comedy kind of stuff. And this was my first kind of, I can look back on that film now. Um, this one I made when I was 15 and it's, it's, it's not, it's not how I would produce it now, but I can see like thematically and the, like what I'm going for and even stylistically, like I do think it kind of aligns with the direction that I've continued to go in. And so I think it really came down to at that point, it's like, I feel like I had found my voice and the kind of stuff that I wanted to say with film, um, with that project. And then once I did, it was just continuing to push it further and further and to explore these ideas until I started making, um, the films that I would now call like my body of work. I went to York for, uh, film, uh, for film production. And so my first few films were made actually as student works. Farm Boy is like my fourth year student work, hence the crew. And so. <clears throat> and that's why I made a conscious effort with my next film, Tiger Eats a Baby. It was my first one that I hadn't made in school. Uh, Farm Boy had my biggest crew. It had the biggest cast of actors. It was my most kind of scripted film up until that point. And so with this next one, I wanted to be more improvisational. I was working with a crew of about, yeah, three people. It was me, the DOP. And then my friend was uh, helping produce it. And then we had an actor. And then I had a co-editor. And that was basically... That was our big kind of crew on that film. Wow. Um, And so really wanting to do everything I had done with Farm Boy, the exact opposite of it. And I think starting from there is where uh, I started going into more like a lo-fi work, really loving this idea of uh, working with limitations. And and even in film school, like there's limitations, like, like there's, there's things you have to do to meet the, uh, the assignment guidelines, shit like that. Right. But this was really like, I don't have the money to produce a big film. And so what can I do? Right. And Mm -hmm. how can I play around with that and and make it more DIY? And I've kind of like continued on with that methodology ever since. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm financing all of these films myself. I've never received any kind of government grant or uh, anything like that to make these films. They all, they, they're all coming out of pocket and and my pockets aren't very deep. (laughs) So, so it really is um, really trying to, but I, but I really do like, love the challenge of like working with limited resources. I think if I was given a million dollars, like I don't think that would be fun. It wouldn't stimulate me creatively. There's, there's other stuff I could do with it. Right. But I love the challenge of these are what we, this is what we have at our disposal. How do we use that to make the best film possible? Right. And not just in a way that feels like a concession, Yes, but in a way where it really highlights like what's important and um, about the work. Right. Like, like, I, th- I think my films and like, uh, they, they benefit from their kind of DIY, uh, the style that they're working in. You know what I mean? Like, I could never see, well, sorry, I could see, I just don't think it would be very good. Like, I could, like a movie like Tiger Eats a Baby as being like uh, uh, having thousands, hundreds of thousand dollars to make that movie, right? Right. I think, I think at the heart of it and what's honest about the film is the fact that it feels so lived in and personal. And I feel like that comes from how kind of intimate it had the intimacy in which it was created, the limitations of its budget. And, uh, and I also think that like kind of mobilizes the crew to kind of like 
really give it their all, right? It's not just a job. It's not like a, it's not a paycheck. It really is like working on this and wanting to create something for the artistic fulfillment of it. We're working in a way that maybe other people wouldn't get down with, but is, is exactly right for what I want to be doing and, and for what the story needs. Mm -hmm. And again, like with that DIY sensibility, I mean, like you shot that apartment in his smell, you, you utilized just about everything you could. And the, the way you move and glide the camera over those spaces is just unreal. How, how many days did that take to shoot, by the way? That was a uh, one-day shoot. One-day shoot. That's beautiful, dude. That's that was a one-day shoot. And, and, I'll, and I'll add on to it, actually, that I was recovering from a broken leg at the time, so I was directing the entire film on crutches. Whoa. Okay. Yeah, well, I first met um, Kaz, uh, Kaz um at York. When he was doing his master's, I was doing my undergrad. He was one of my TAs. And oh, cool. so uh, we first connected that way. And then, um, yeah, at the same time, he was kind of working on um, Anne. And um, he brought me on that film. He, um, he really loved my um, uh, MDFF actually screened uh, my second film, this documentary, Liam and Kiki, from 2017. They had screened it. He really liked that film. And then after that, he asked me to come on and... Um, and yeah, work on Anne. He, I, I think, yeah, he kind of recruited me first as like as a like as the director, kind of just liking uh, like the vision that I was bringing to these films, basically. Um, and I, I think he, there was a bit of a kinship in um, in in my style almost that he saw. And this was unintentional. I hadn't seen Kaz's work at this time, but Liam and Kiki's composed almost entirely of close up photography of the subjects. Mm. And so I think Kaz really connected to that. It's very similar to kind of the style that he'd been working in. And so I think that's kind of what initially connected us. And I started working on um, Anna 3000 Feet. And then his producer for that, uh, Dan Montgomery, then brought me on to The Maiden and um, that he also produced. And uh, now I'm actually working on Kaz's uh, new feature. And so that's kind of how that started. But yeah, Kaz has been a big inspiration to me. Like he's the one where I kind of uh, learned where you don't need an, uh, like a huge crew to make films like he really does have like a sound person the dop you know what i mean like the producer on set and that's about it uh, yeah i love the intimacy that kaz works with in terms of these like character studies he does of these people just the rawness of it and and i really do think a lot of that comes down to just like the intimacy of the crew the ability to like work with actors with all the like encumbrance of like a so-called production and so, yeah, really kind of taking inspiration from his, like, working methods. Because that's the thing. Like, it, again, coming off of Farm Boy, like, it, it, that was, that was, I guess that's the one thing that kind of, um, the one stressor in Farm Boy was having to control this, like, huge crew, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, grateful for all of them for working on the project. And it couldn't be what it is without that, that crew because it was such a big film, right? But at the same time really wanting to feel like like again taking it back to being nine years old and feeling like it's, it is like play you know what i mean absolutely and and then like the freedom of being able to work in that style where it's i have my dop i have my actor i have someone running sound that's all i need there was this great <laughs> i'm gonna misquote it but there was this um I, I there was this great like interview where harmony kareen was talking about how for Gummo, he wanted to go into this like abandoned building and none of the crew wanted to go to with him. And the DOP was like, fuck all them. We'll go in together. That's all we need. And I, and I think that's, I think that's just so, I think that's so beautiful and just so true. And it's like, I, I want what's best for the film. You know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. ultimately, I think with the films I'm making, the, like the intimate nature um, that I want them to kind of convey, I think, yeah, operating a way where it feels more like play and feels more like, yeah, friends kind of working on this project together and not just, a big crew doing tech jobs and that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Cause you always hear about these bigger, you know, directors with funding and large crews always wanting to go back to the basics, quote unquote, you know, and make a movie in their backyard again. Right. Exactly. And I just, I love having the relationships where it's like, like I've, I've worked with the same, uh, like my friend, Amon Samra. Um, I've worked with him on basically every, every film that has original footage by me, so not taking of Jordan, not but everyone that I've shot is shot by him. Okay, um, and so I love being able to work a lot with the same kind of crew members and and people that you know kind of uh, share your vision and know what you're going for and know how to bring that out. Um, Absolutely, because like other DOPs and like that I've I've witnessed and experienced, like they really want to. Uh, feels like push their vision on the film yes, or or tell you how your vision should kind of be or how it should come across. 
Whereas I feel like Amon hears my vision, he shares it with me, and um, he knows exactly what I want, what I'm going for, and he knows the best way to kind of um, bring that out. Um, and so having this kind of relationship with your uh, crew members, exactly, where it's not just technicians, it's not just people, like, you're talking about people who don't even like film, you know what I mean? Exactly. Really working on film, it's like, no, like, all of my, all of my crew members are, like, fucking cinephiles, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's the way it like, should be. Straight up. Exactly. And it's like, cause I want to work with people cause I'm a fucking freak cinephile. So it's like, I want to work with people who are like, who are like-minded and really understand what I'm going for. And that I'm not going for a kind of traditional kind of looking or produced movie. And I want to work in this kind of in between or this different method and, and people who really want to embrace that with me and share in that. I think that like, we as artists, we all have our own like unique kind of individual vision. And I think all we can really do is like try and bring that to the forefront, make something that only we can make. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I think if, if if I could write a script and hand it to another filmmaker and they would make the exact same movie, uh, then I don't think that's interesting. You know what I mean? Like, exactly. I think it's just paint by numbers at that point. You, exactly. It's like, what's something that only you can do? It's like, we're, we're put on this world, like earth. So you know what I mean? To express something while we're here. And if we're just going to like conform to uh, a standard of like what we think film is supposed to be and not really explore what it could be. I think it's just a, it's an artistic disservice to ourselves, but also to film in general, to, to audiences. You know what I mean? I think Absolutely. that like film is in a lot of ways, it's still such a young form. You know what I mean? And I'm interested in exploring like what film can still be as opposed to like conforming to what we know it as. And I think any artist, uh, yeah, even outside of film, right? Like art in general, just like, trying to push trying to push the history of it further into the future hell yeah, yeah. You can follow Khalil and watch his work through the links in the show notes, where you can also support the show by joining the Patreon. Thank you so much for listening to The Shootable Book Show. Spread the word, tell your friends, and go make stuff. Mm-hmm.